And the snake comes, the serpent comes and starts to speak to Eve. And what did he say? Say it out loud. Did God really say, right? Now, how many of you have had that voice in your head? <laughs> it's not the Holy Spirit, is it? It's the tempter. It's the accuser of the brethren who said, did God really say? And, and, you know, he's painted this way in the Bible as an attorney who's bringing charges against you. He's the accuser of the brethren. And, and the problem is that some of the things he says are true because we are not perfect people. We make mistakes and he can get legal on us. And if we don't know who we are in Christ and we don't say, yeah, but Satan, that penalty has already been paid. My record has been expunged by the blood. <laughs> the jail door opened up and I was given a reprieve by the blood of the lamb, by the word of my testimony, by loving my life, not even unto death. We overcame you, Satan. You have been cast down, Satan, it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 10. Look it up. Memorize that one because when he's coming at you, see, she didn't know this. She was being beguiled, and he said, she, he said to her, basically, I'm summarizing, God is stingy. Yeah, you can have from all those other trees, but why won't he let you have from this tree? And that's what the devil just always tries to do, get you to think that God's stingy. He's holding out on you. He, the devil will say, he doesn't want you to have the knowledge of good and evil because then you'll be like him. And you know, if you tell a child that you can have everything in the kitchen except the cookies in the cookie jar, <laughs> where are they going? <laughs> right to the cookie jar. You ever see the film of the little kid? He's sitting at a table and they're filming him, right? It's a, an experiment and they put a marshmallow on the table. And they say, listen, I'm going to walk out here for a few minutes, but if you can wait till I come back, you can have two marshmallows. But if you eat this one, you can't have the second marshmallow. I'll be right back. And they leave. And now they're filming the kid. And he's turning his back on it. You know, and he's looking at it. And he's touching it. And he pulls a little piece off, and then he turns it upside down. So that'll be on the bottom so that they won't see it. And he's smelling it. Oh, my God, it's the most amazing picture. You can look it up online. There's millions of hits. Because it's what sin does. It's very tempting. One kid didn't even hesitate. He, before the lady got out the door, he stuck the whole thing in his mouth. <laughs> right? And, and some of them waited. And, but, but nobody was, was without being really tempted. So now all of a sudden, Eve is just like, she, there's this thing. A, a seed of doubt has been planted in her heart about the character of God. So just be careful. Because that could happen to us, can't it? Yeah. I'm serving you. I'm doing everything they told me. I've gotten prophetic words, and I'm not seeing it come to pass. Maybe it's not really true. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. So I said it a few weeks ago. Do you remember I said it wasn't an apple? What was it? I think uh, she, she turns around, and she reaches up on that branch, and she just pulls one of them off. And whether she was like the little boy with the marshmallow or not, I don't know. But she pulled off of that. And she ate it. And then Adam came back, and he ate some too. And it says their eyes, their eyes were open. And the first thing that happened when their eyes were open is they knew they were naked, and they were ashamed, so they hid. So maybe there's something about the knowledge of good and evil that's a two-edged sword. And maybe when Satan tempts you, it's usually got a two-edged sword to it, and you can't see the sharp edge that's going to cut you back. You just see the part that looks so tempting. God's holding out on me. He's really robbing me of, of fun that I could be having. No, he's not. He knows what's better for you than what your flesh knows. And all of a sudden now, God comes into the garden and he realizes, and now we're at 2 o'clock. Sin has come into the garden and they fall. And at 3 o'clock on your calendar, it says death. Now, they didn't die, but they brought death into the garden. And that was never God's intention. And as a pastor for 20 years now, uh, going on 21 years, people have come to me, and, and some of the hardest things is, if God's such a loving God, why do so many terrible things happen to people? Right? And, and all you have to do is go back to the book of Genesis and realize when they ate, when, when she picked that fruit off and, and disobeyed, she brought a curse on humanity. And that opened up a war. Right? Anybody fond of a war? No. Nobody likes it. But it's the reality of what we face. It wasn't his plan for us. 
If they had been obedient, we'd have had a whole different world, but we are at least in the new dispensation where Jesus came and died and delivered us from that sin that we had, and now you have Holy Spirit on the inside of you to live a life that's empowered by the same power that's going to fully empower us when we're with him forever. Verse 11, see it? He came to his own people, and even they, what? Rejected him because they didn't know what they were looking for. They were expecting a general of the army to defeat the Romans. And this was a humble king. This was a servant king. And it was too far outside their paradigm. But who did recognize? The sinners, the tax collectors, the broken people of society. When David was on the run from Saul, who came to him at the cave of Adullam? Do you remember? All the outcast people, the criminals, the thieves, 400 people showed up, and they were all like they had just been let out of jail. And God said, these are your mighty men, David. <laughs> this is how you're going to be king. And Jesus said, you know what? The things that are important to the world are an abomination to God. God looks at the outside. We look. I'm sorry. Man looks at the outside. Jesus would say, me and the Father and the Holy Spirit look at your heart. And these broken people in the culture became the birthing of the church. Awesome, isn't it? No matter where you are on the hierarchy, he got born in a field, not at the Hilton. He can relate to the lowest rung of the society. When you do it to the least of these, he said, my brethren, you're doing it to me. It's not upward mobility in the kingdom. It's downward mobility. Yes. Oh, no freedom like that freedom. So the second Adam comes, that should tell us something. That what the first Adam couldn't do, the second Adam is going to do. <laughs> and he's going to set a model for us. So that dirt that God breathed into the first time got defiled by sin. Now Jesus lives and he's a new form of dirt because he was human. Son of man and the son of God. But he makes it all the way to 7 o'clock. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, 7. I got, I got to tell Tell my own time on my own clock here. You came up with it. It's actually 8 o'clock that I want to go to. And it says he's pinned to a tree. And I purposely used that word, pinned, because of that picture that I shared a couple weeks ago, where she goes on this side of the tree, and she pulls the grape off and eats it, right? And that was the meal that brought sin in. And then he goes on this side, and he decides to get pinned back up on the cross. Right, And that cycle of something coming off now gets completed by him getting pinned back up as the sacrifice. And, and he's not fully done with the cycle yet because he hasn't resurrected. But the picture of the second Adam is the first one failed on this side, but the second one is completing the cycle here and coming full circle. Why it was a great. See, what did they offer him? Sour wine. <laughs> Wouldn't it be sour? Because that's sin. What did he turn the water into at the wedding? What was the first miracle he did? Like all your mess, I'm going to turn it into something good. I'm going to take what, what was trying to kill you and give you life from it. But the story doesn't end there, does it? Because he's still on the cross. That wouldn't, got, that wouldn't have got us in. It got us his blood. I mean, we got a huge amount of reactions on one of our posts on Facebook because all I did was, was quote a scripture and put a picture of Jesus hanging on a cross, and there's like hundreds of people responded. Most of the time, they'll just say amen. But then other times, people will say, you know, it really spoke to me, man, that picture, something about that picture. Well, it's not our picture. It's just him. It's what he did for us, that he made a way for us into the holy of holies through a new and living way. That's a Hebrews. Through a new and living way, his body was broken open so that we could have access through his body through the, to the cross. So the cycle's not totally done yet, though. He's only on the cross. Then what do they do? They take him down off the cross, and this is now dead dirt. Just like Adam was dead dirt when he sinned. Now, he brought death, but this is dead dirt that has never sinned. And what happens? They bring him into the tomb, and all of a sudden, God breathes again. So just like God breathed the first time for the first Adam, and life came into Adam, 
Now God breathes again, and life comes into the dead body of Jesus. And this time, this second Adam does not fall into sin. So the very thing God wanted from the beginning was the second Adam, a man who lives his whole life with no sin. And now you have access to that. That should get you really excited. Because that's why we were singing it over and over again. Because he lives, I can live today. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you and me. Look at the person next to you. Say, wake up. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. What are you complaining about? <laughs> you got him living in you. I mean, not a low voltage little nine volt battery either, okay? This is not some little low voltage charge. I don't know about you, did you? I have a battery in my guitar and sometimes I take it out because the red light comes on. Ever do that? <laughs> to see if it's got, it's got a charge in it? I won't kiss Trisha after I do that, I promise. <laughs> but you know, if there's a little bit of charge left, you feel a little tingling. No Christian is ever supposed to live like that. We're not connected to low voltage. We're connected to the nuclear power source. That's who lives on the inside of you. Why would you go to the counterfeit when you got the real deal? 